I work for the CIA. I am not a spy. I just read books. We read everything that's published in the world. And we, we feed the plots, dirty tricks, codes, into a computer, and the computer checks against actual CIA plans and operations. I look for leaks, I look for new ideas. We read adventures and novels and journals. I, I, who'd invented Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margo P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margo D. of Brooklyn Fit Chick. Hi everyone. It's just us chickens this week. Yes. We had, a, we had a, an unusual little like couple of weeks of guests, which was so fun. Really yes. had so much fun with both of them. Um. So it's, I know it actually feels a little strange to be doing what we've always done. <laughs> um, and we have a really super fun book and movie to talk about today. I'm surprised we've not done this before. Um, and I can't wait to talk about it because we haven't really had a lot of time to discuss it offline yet. And, um, but before we get to that, before we get to that, if you're new, if you're just joining us, uh, yes, this is a podcast. Is that your sirens or mine? Mine, but I don't think it's going to pick okay. up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I just heard sirens. We, I'm in San Diego, y'all, and we are <laughs> awaiting like this once in a century storm. Um, not to make light of it, but, you know, it's a big deal. People, rain is a big deal here. So um, it's been a it's been a little weird. Like people are sandbagging and like really hunkering down. So I thought, uh-oh, sirens. Um, but no, it's it's on the other side of the continent. As it's over in Brooklyn, out. and it's that's a normal thing where I live. I live near two hospitals, so I, I don't there even actually go. hear it after a while. Um, but if you are new, if you're just joining us, yeah. So we're we're both named Margo. We're on opposite sides of the United States, and uh, this podcast we we talk about movies that have been adapted from books. Yes, but because we do a brand new episode every single week, we had to. Ex- we've been doing this for going on 10 years. And um, so um, a while back, we decided um, that we would expand what we mean by book to mean any literary source. So as long as the movie is readily available, you know, you're streaming on an easy to get to place, um, and it is adapted from any literary source, a magazine article, a short story, novella, a song, a play, we will consider it. So if you have suggestions for books and movies that we can do, uh, we could make those suggestions to us on the internet. You can meet other listeners of this podcast in a couple of places. We do have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like it, but we're much more interactive in our Facebook group. You type in book VS movie podcast group and ask to join. We have two posts at the very top of the page that our fan Elliot, I'm sorry, Thaddeus put together. We, sorry, we both have allergies as well that we're dealing with here. Anyway, Thaddeus is very kind to put up two posts, one that says all the shows we've done before, pretty complete list, and then a list of an ongoing list of what your ideas are. So that's a really great place to start. It is a private group. We just talk about books and movies there. We are on Twitter as long as that exists. Uh, you spell out book versus a movie. We're on threads and Instagram book versus movie. And we have an old timey email book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. And if you would like some stickers or I've, I found a few magnets you could put on your fridge or something, let me know, send us your address and we will drop them in the mail for you. I have three on my fridge. Neat little <laughs> row. Uh, <laughs> And if you really enjoy the show and you would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Look up Book the S Movie Podcasts. We have over about eight years of shows that are up there. We started doing this just over nine years ago. We're going to be going into our 10th year. We recently put up there Psycho, Silence of the Lambs, 
everything we've done in the past is up on that wall. Also, there are quite a few things there that are free of the older stuff if you want to go check those out. And we appreciate everyone that does that for us. It helps us get the books and the movies. For example, for the book we're talking about today, we had to get paperback copies, and that's actually a way that helps us. So thank you all and that do that, that, do that for us. Yeah, we really try to make this as accessible as possible for mm-hmm. folks. So we really, really appreciate your support. Um, okay, so so here's the thing. Um, you sent me this book. Mm-hmm. Thank you, by the way. And I uh, I recently had to make yet another trip to our state capital for my job, which I do. Like I've done it. I've lost count how many times I've been this year. But um, my flight was delayed here in San Diego. So I'm sitting there on the airplane and they tell us it's going to be a minute. And I'm like, okay. So I pull the book. I hadn't even started. I had packed it in my backpack, pull it out of my backpack. And when I finished the book, we still had 45 minutes left of the flight. Oh. (laughs) That's how long. (laughs) And I will say, we're talking today about three days of The Condor starring Mr. Robert Redford um, and the book is originally it was called Six Days of the Condor. Although the edition that you sent me says three days on the spine. It says three days they of the Condor. They changed it when the movie came out. Yes. But when you read it, it is six days. It's a little confusing. You're like, and it's okay. actually eight days he's talking about. We'll get it into it in actually, a second. <laughs> it's a whole week. But we'll talk about why he couldn't call it that. <laughs> um really interesting story about how this came to be um i i'm i'm really i don't know that i've ever read anything by james grady before but let, let's talk about this guy this is his very first novel um he's super young i mean he's practically a student when he writes it right and um and so you know we we were just saying before we got on the air like there's some it reads like a first novel, but there is some really good stuff in there. And um, but so let's talk about him because he's become a, a really important writer to, and very influential um, to so many other writers and filmmakers. And because world of kind events. of the way this story unfolded. Yeah. And world events just kind of un- well, prescient, I think we can say. Right. James Brady, he was born April 30th, 1949. He is from Montana. He was raised in a Christian conservative household. When he went to college, he worked for a center, Lee Metcalf. He worked for the Montana Institutional Convention, but he also always wanted to be a writer. And he was living off of basically as a as a writer, I think he made like less than ten thousand dollars a year to support himself. He was living in Montana and then he got to go to D.C. He also worked for Jack Anderson. Jack Anderson from when I was a kid was this guy that went on Good Morning America and talked about politics. He was like 100 years old and he knew John Kennedy. But anyway, he um, he was around these very smart people. This was also the time of the early 70s when this book comes out in 1974. That's the year that Nixon resigns from the White House. So America for about 10 years about there from when we started the Vietnam War, entered into the Vietnam War and then up until this point, which it wasn't over yet, there's this idea of like people becoming paranoid. Like, what is the government really doing? What are they telling us? What's the truth? What's not the truth? Which is also very prescient <laughs> to what's happening today. The original like deep state uh, uh, paranoia. And uh, what I found was so interesting. And thank you for sending me the link to that. What was the name of the book that you sent me the link to? Um, I will look that up right now. He wrote a book about with. So the character that he develops in Six Days of the Condor, um, again, his first his first work, um, he later goes on to explore Condor as sort of like a James Bond kind of a figure where Condor is an agent name that's given to it's a CIA agent um, given to various men um, over Ameri- this you know late 20th century American history um, and who are given the name Condor. Um, and then re, I think revisiting the original one, right, at, at the very last story. But one of the things that I thought was so interesting about his life story, so he's not from a big city. Right. He's from Montana. And, I, you know, I've been to Helena, Montana. My best friend lives in Montana. Oh, and she's a member of our group. Hi, Carola. Hi. And um, she lives in uh, Big Fork. 
and or, or close to Big Fork. And um, so it's not a huge place is what I'm saying. And he really, really wants to be always wanted to be a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. And his drive to be a fiction writer um, and make a living as a fiction writer um, sends him kind of looking for any professional opportunity that will allow him to write at all. And the opportunities that present himself are sort of journalism adjacent. And so he's writing for like local newspapers and pieces for, for you know, this, magazines and stuff like that. Um, and through that work, he gets this political job as an aide and the political job as an aide or, or you know, uh, I forget what his position is with the senator. But but anyway, he gets a job with a Montana uh, um, congressman and he's that propels him into this journalism, real, real journalism. Right. Uh, kind of job. And that propels him into what he and it all happens super fast. It all happens by the time he's 24. He has a best selling novel. <laughs> with a movie option <laughs> it doesn't happen always i think stephen king's the no. other one that you and i but i mean stephen king actually was trying for 10 plus years before yeah it's condor but, the short takes that's what i said the short you. takes thank yes. you um but like when we talked about a similar story was peter benchley um with jaws yep. but peter benchley had connections he had he had he had you know world of literature connections that helped him um <clears throat> get land that uh deal where where Grady is a very different kind of a story. He um he's just this young man who is just wants to write for a living. And any place that is going to let him write for a living, he's taking it. And it just happens that the course of that, pursuing that dream, um, gives him the life experience that he needs to land this amazing hit right out of the gate with his first novel. First of all, get his first novel accepted. He was living in a major publisher, Montana. I mean, this is late 60s, early 70s, not like an Internet age. And he just mm -hmm. sent his manuscript to a bunch of people. He didn't even know who to go to. He didn't have an agent no. or anything. So he just sent them to different editors. And then he was turned down by a couple of places. He said he was like duct taping his shower head to the shower thing to like his, <laughs> he was so broke um, moving out of his parents' house and just living on you know, less than a thousand dollars a month or whatever. And then uh, he co contacts Norton and they say, yeah, not only are we taking this book, but we think it's going to be picked for a movie. You need to come to New York. And he was in this position that he had written out his manuscript and then he worked with his editors to change it because they knew ultimately was going to be, but he had that deal and the, the book after that. All happened really quickly. And then super fast. And Sidney Pollack was this director and Sidney Pollack was very collaborative with writers. He was very lucky that Pollack would like explain to him, this is what we did. And this is why we changed it. Yeah. Robert Redford it's was better really for great film with because of X, Y, Z. Right. Yeah, and he understood. Which helps him be a better writer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, these are all it's amazing, but he had an idea in his head. So he's living in DC and in Montana. And he had this idea, like, what if I went to work one day? And everybody died. And it's because something's going on that I didn't realize. What would I do? And that's, so then he propels himself. And it's a great story. I would say like, with long with, we talked about Michael Crichton last week with our, our guests. <laughs> we didn't talk about our real feelings about Jurassic Park, the writing. But we say, I mean, I say anyway, I've read a lot of his books and they're great plots. I just don't think the dialogue is all that good. Yeah. Yeah. But this, I think is... I, I mean, for a first effort, first it's remarkably effort, good. Yes. Um, as a as an idea, a story idea, I think it's brilliant. Yeah, he's he's a um, he's a low guy in the feeding chain in his professional life in Washington, and so he's you know he's walking around. And he's like, well, that building is, I forget what it was called, the real building that inspired mm -hmm. the story. And he realizes, like, he never sees anybody go in and out of this building ever. Like, it's, but there it is every day. And he starts to think, well, like, maybe what if it's a front? What if it's like a front for the CIA or something? And, oh, gosh, what if I worked there? And one day I showed up and everybody was <laughs> gunned down. Uh, what would happen? <clears throat> and it's a really, you know, I mean, that's how a fiction writer would would um, would think about it. And I will say, like, um, uh, it's not a long book. 
Yes. Um, and apparently in the original version, there was like an, a beginning of like a prologue and epilogue that had some tie in with Vietnam that the the editors um, said to jettison. So I don't know what that was, but um, but I think the way it starts is very like it grabs you. Uh, it is a great story to read in the airport or while you're stuck on an airplane oh. because it's a you know, it's a, a espionage thriller. Action packed. Lots of characters and double agents. And by the way, we're going to spoil everything. Yes. By um, the way. <laughs> and many characters. Three of them are women. <laughs> yes. We and should... two of those women are killed in the second chapter. <laughs> and two of them are romantic interests, right? I mean. Not in the, not in the book. Not in the, the book, book. In the book, the two women who are killed work in the building with him. And they are, they are also, I, I took, I have a picture of it somewhere because I, I had to underline, I had to dig out a pen on the plane and underline it just so I wouldn't forget that um, two of these women are CIA agents. They work in this building with our main character who's named Malcolm mm -hmm. in the book. And um, he describes them in terms of their um, ability to make coffee for the other agents in the building um the younger female agent her coffee's not very good and i think it must be because she's a cia agent <laughs> was they also um and we've talked about james bond we've talked about other writers that served as spies during world war ii or or in the great war and it influenced their writing and it influenced the genre Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, uh, excuse me, uh, John F. Kennedy was a huge fan of the spy novels. And, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, intrigue also is going into like, what if the government were against you? And it had all this power and you don't have that power and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, and they can trace everything. Yeah. They have all the technology available to them. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so we like, talked about that as well. And that's kind of a similar it's very, thing. He talks about being great. He talks about being very influenced by Manchurian Candidate in particular, mm -hmm. which is a great, another yes. great, great story. On our Patreon page. And great <laughs> movie. Um, yeah. So it's not like the, and then the third character, the third woman in the book um, is abducted at gunpoint and then falls in love with the main character who kidnapped her like you do. Um, so those are the three women. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's lots and lots of men. Um, but it is a, a, I really, I, there were a lot of changes that are made between the book and the movie. And I totally get why, but I really like the way the story unfolds in the book. I have to say. So we have our, our main character whose name is Malcolm. I think Malcolm is his last name. His name is like Ronald Malcolm, right? Ronald Malcolm. And he works in a building that's called the, like the American Historical Society. And he describes, at first he's describing the building because he's kind of, he's kind of walking to work and he's coming up on the building and he's sort of musing about what the building looks like. The very nondescript building with a little plaque. And when you go in the building, there's um, this kindly, you know, kind of spinstery lady sitting behind the desk and when people come in to ask about the literary society she'll give them the whole history of the society and then kind of politely shoo them out the door um and then we learn that um she is a cia agent <laughs> who makes coffee uh the, she makes the boys the better coffee in the building um but they everybody employed there and it's not a lot of people it's like uh let me see it's like eight of them i think mm -hmm. um eight of them and they are in a not very sexy wing department of the CIA. They are not James Bond. Um, they are not infiltrating anything. Their job is research. They are, they are just there to read research, read reports, read books, read newspaper accounts, read novels. Um, they are the, they are the, um, the Google of the CIA. They are the, they, their job is to be the database for the CIA, the people who are out in the field to be like, could somebody kill somebody in this way? Or could somebody infiltrate a, a government in this way? And they'd be like, well, yes, in this novel, the plot was like this, or in that newspaper article from 1936, um, there was a similar plot of that where XYZ happened. So 
that's their job is they just comb through endless reams of information um, looking for useful stuff that they might need in in the pursuit of of intelligence uh, for the CIA. And okay, so here's here's a big difference between the book and the movie. So I can't remember, is he recalling the conversation that he has with Heidegger? Um, I can't remember. I will say something about this book that I didn't like as a choice was that it changes narrators like yes. constantly. It, it makes it very confusing in that way. You are correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. It does. It's a lot of, again, it's, it's not necessary. Very, it's action packed. Not necessary. We don't need it. We could all, we could have had it all from Malcolm's point of view at one point. So, but they're disguised as this literary society, right? So to all, for, to the outside world, they look like a literary society. There are, there are book trucks that come every every day or every week, and they deliver boxes of books, and they take boxes of books. Um, and it all looks like it's on the up and up. And one day, one of Malcolm's co-workers, he's re- I think he's remembering one of Malcolm's co-workers, like the day before, um, it, they're just chatting. And the, the co-worker's like, you know, Malcolm, I, I came across this kind of weird thing, and I, I brought it up to our higher-ups, and they don't seem to think it's a big deal, but it's kind of nagging at me. He says, you know, um, like I was looking at the invoices. I'm supposed to check these invoices of the, of the boxes of books, you know, that come in and out of here. And he's like, yeah. And he says, well, we have every, every time the shipment comes in, we, it was something like we have the right number of boxes, but the wrong number of books, I think is what it is. It's something like that where it looks right, but it's not quite right. It doesn't quite add up. There's a discrepancy there, he says, and I can't quite figure it out because when I go to account for everything, it's all accounted for. But then when I look at the numbers, it's not. And I don't, what's going on there? I don't, it, and it's ha- it's ha- consistently happening. And Malcolm's like, huh, yeah, that's weird. It's weird, man. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if they say it's nothing, it's probably nothing. It's basically what comes of it. And then when he shows up at work, that, uh, that coworker is out sick. And he's like, doesn't think anything of it because the guy was coming down with a cold. So no big whoop. So he goes, you know, he, he clocks in because it's a very, it's a very humdrum job. Clocks in, says hi. Um, he's the kind of young rebel of the group. He has a slightly different background than everybody else. But, um, but still, you know, I mean, he's rebellious in that he doesn't want to wear a suit every day. Like he's right. not, you know. It's the 70s, um, by the way. I remember that. It's yeah. the 70s. And um, so the older guys in the outfit are kind of razzing him and for not taking things seriously. And the younger guys, you know, he kind of pals around with them. And, and as sort of a punishment or, you know, just sort of a like sort of a dig, one of the older guys says, OK, hey, it's your turn to get everybody lunch. Which I gather is something one of the women would have done, but um, but the the guy's kind of getting after uh, Malcolm, so he's he's making him uh, be the guy who gets lunch. And Malcolm's like, yeah, okay, fine, I'll I'll go get lunch. And but here's the key thing: instead of going out the front door, he decides he's going to take this secret exit out of the building that most people don't know about because it get, it's going to shave a little time off of his uh the time that he has to go get lunch so he can he can just ding around uh, and have a smoke and you know he has a little time to like goof off while he's supposed to be getting the lunch so he takes this extra little uh, detour out of the that takes him out of the back of the building and he's hanging out waiting for the lunch to be cooked and he's chatting with the folks at the diner um you know no big no big whoop what nothing nothing going on and um and then like margo said he shows up back at the office and everyone is dead right in the book i think we see we again we switch like she says we switch perspectives to the killers right so while malcolm is gone now which i don't think we needed any of that but okay um it's just kind of salacious the the killers blow into the place they blow up the spinster lady behind the desk she can grab her gun um they you know it's all like one by one these grisly murders um 
ending with the other female um, in the in the outfit. And um, yeah, I don't. It, it goes on for kind of a long time, and it's super violent. But um, anyway, so Malcolm comes back, and this is what he discovers. He's he comes on this scene, and he doesn't know what to think. He's not James Bond. He's he's a pencil pusher. <laughs> he's you know? just a nerdy little uh, reader guy. He doesn't. Yeah, that's all he does for a living is he reads, and so he's like, I don't know how to fight. I don't know how to. But the thing is, he's clever. He's read enough of these mm-hmm. books and enough of these plots that he's kind of like. Well, if this were to happen to a character, what would I recommend? What do I think would happen right. in the plot? And that's how he decides to deal with it. So he in the book, he does call and tell them what happens and they do mm-hmm. tell him. He reports it. He reports it. So he has to, you know, kind of stay low for a little bit and while he's figuring out what's going on. I believe in the book he changes his appearance, right? He gets a haircut and dyes his hair. He does. He gets a haircut, he dyes his hair. And he goes around speaking with a thick Southern accent. None of that is in the movie uh, because Robert Redford. Um, right. So, <laughs> so he starts to realize, I'm trying to think when. Okay. So he calls what he, Grady says he invented this idea he calls a panic line, like a CIA panic line and says, Hey, I work at this division. My code name is Condor. Um, everybody, everybody did. And, um, they're like, okay, Condor, we're going to try to bring you in safely. Um, call us back in an hour and we'll give you instructions. He's like, cool. So he, as Margo says, he, um, I think, is that the point where he changes his appearance? I'm not sure, but, um, then you then we switch perspectives again to the people on the CIA side. And this high up guy says, Okay, I will go and collect the I will go and collect the condor. And we should, he's probably gonna be wondering if he can trust us. So we need to bring somebody that he knows personally and, and trusts. And in the book, it's different than in the movie. I think it's better in the movie, actually. But in the book, they choose one of Condor's um former professors mm-hmm. who he knew very well and would know by sight. Um, like a mentor. And so the mentor and this high up uh, CIA guy arranged to meet Malcolm. I think it's behind a movie theater, right? He's in the movies and he's supposed to like- And they're in D.C., the by the theater. way, too. They're in D.C., yeah, at this point. And, um, and so um, Malcolm goes out in the alley. He sees his professor. So he's like, oh, cool. All right. So this is on the up and up. And the before anything happens, he sees the the general guy or you know the, the high up CIA guy that he doesn't know whips out a gun and points it at him. He's like, "This guy is going to kill me!" So he shoots. He's got the the spinster lady's gun that he took out of her desk. He shoots down. He manages to to shoot get a shot of the guy's leg. I think um, doesn't not a, not like a kill shot. He, enough to knock him down. Mm-hmm. And the as the guy is falling, now he is an expert. You know, he is James Bond, this guy. Um, so as he is falling from this gunshot that he's gotten from Condor, he turns around and shoots the professor um, through the head, I think, it, to shot. kill him. Yeah. Uh, one shot, one shot killed him. You know, just like super marksman shot. And, um, and then it's reported that Condor killed both of these men. And so now he's on the run. And that's when he, I think that's when he cuts his hair, dyes his hair, starts speaking with a Southern accent, and then abducts this girl. Um, Kathy. Whose name is Wendy. Wendy in the book. Her name is Wendy. Wendy Ross. Um, yes. Sorry. Wendy Ross. I don't know why they changed all the names for the movie, but they did. Um, <laughs> but anyway, in the book, her name is Wendy. Uh, he is at a, and I think another diner that he hears somebody call her by name. She, he sees her leave alone. He sees that she has a car. He's like, this is my, great she's chance. going on vacation for two weeks and she doesn't want to answer the phone. Doesn't want anybody to hang Perfect. out with her. Yes. She's going to be yes. in her apartment for two weeks. So he, he walks up to her like, Hey, Wendy with Southern accent, which I cannot do. And, um, you know, jabs the gun in her and like, says, you're taking me to your house. And in the, and this part is similar to the movie where he tries to explain to her, like he tries, he gives her her, his real name and really just is totally honest and open with her about what is going on. 
And she, understandably, she's just been abducted by at gunpoint. She doesn't believe him at first. He sort of proves to her by showing his his pseudo work ID and showing her that it's actually the CIA. If you just look it up in the phone book, you can see right there. And um, and she she comes to believe him much more readily than um in the movie and much more readily than is at all plausible it's, in my opinion <laughs> the wendy stuff in the book i actually Ooh. you know there's i actually I, I put a sticky the sex scene in this book oh, okay was, oh you all wow. listen wow. listen <laughs> okay here's what happens in the book <laughs> This is very different. It's so much better in the movie. I promise. I yeah. promise. If you've never seen this movie. Um, so in the book, again, cannot stress this enough. He has kidnapped her at gunpoint. A young woman who lives alone. And she is in the apartment with a man with a gun who has kidnapped her. She is completely vulnerable and defenseless. And uh, you know, even if she believes what he says, that doesn't make him any less dangerous, right? It's not boyfriend and, uh, material. This is uh, he still has a gun, um, and so they. The, he's like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna rest, but you know, if if you try anything, I'm gonna shoot you basically in the night. We're gonna we're just gonna get some rest and and uh, and I'll try to get out of here in the morning. I'll try to be out of your hair in the morning. He's not he's not mean to her, but he has kidnapped her at gunpoint. Um, which I think is pretty mean. Um, so <laughs> in the middle of the night, naturally, she climbs into bed with him. Well, she just took a shower, Margo. It got her horny or whatever. So oh, well, Yeah. And the way he, by the way, he describes her, even before this, I picked this girl. She's flattering. kind of okay looking. I've seen better and her boobs aren't that great. Makes the point yeah. of saying that. He makes the point of saying her face is just okay and her boobs aren't that great. And uh, I mean, yeah, she could be curvier. She, yeah, exactly. Ex he's expecting like yeah, Farrah Fawcett or somebody. I mean, just I don't know. I it's it's laughable. It's it's kind of like. Ugh. So she climbs into bed with him. So she climbs into bed with him, has sex with him, which he readily does. Oh, and describes no how much point, she is enjoying it. <laughs> at no point is he is he like you know maybe this isn't a great idea. Maybe we should not do this. No, he's all in. And she now is in love with him. She now is just, she's all in for the condor. She's Smitten like a kitten. 100% team condor. And she just wants to help him however she possibly can. And so he is, um, I forget, he makes some mistake that gives away where they are. And right. this guy shows up dressed as the mailman. And we know that the we know that the killers. He doesn't know this, but we know that the killers who killed all the people in the building were also dressed as mailmen mm -hmm. um, and delivery guys. And um, so this guy dressed as a mailman shows up and proceeds to try to gun them down. And Condor is able to. St I think they both of them are able to subdue the guy and shoot him and kill him. And now they've killed a guy. <laughs> right. And they are they are really on the run. Right. Um, and then, so they are, they are fleeing. They don't know what's up. And Condor finds, uh, he manages to get a hold of somebody in the CIA who has a suspicion of what might be going on and has a suspicion that Condor, because they know that Condor doesn't have the training, the marksmanship to have killed the professor the way that the professor was killed. Mm -hmm. Whoever killed the professor is and the angle of it and everything. They figure out like the 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 high CIA guy could only have been the one that killed the professor. So what was that about? Why did he have to why was it so important for that guy to be killed? So somebody in the CIA smells rat and suspects that Condor is just an innocent pawn. And Condor what I'm trying to say is the point of all of this was that Condor in this book is much more of an innocent pawn mm -hmm. than in the movie. He's younger too. In, Let's be he's clear. He's younger too. And in the book, he all that happened was the guy that stumbled upon the actual, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? shenanigans, um, mentioned it to Condor, and Condor didn't even know what it was about. Um, but he, you know, he this he just happened to be the guy that the coworker told, and that's why. 
uh, he he is now the only survivor. And uh, whereas in the movie, the Condor is the one who co- uncovers the plot and all of that. So he has no idea what he's running from. He doesn't know who he can trust. He thinks he can maybe trust this one guy from the CIA who he's been communicating with on the phone. And it's all about trying to uh, figure out what the who the double agent is or are and um, how to get the condor safely out of this situation alive. And maybe Wendy can also be alive or maybe not. Yes. <laughs> um, so there's this scene where so condor has already altered his appearance. So there's this scene where um, they are supposed to rendezvous with somebody or other. And Wendy, he has Wendy wearing a disguise. Um, And the disguise is a padded bra to make her less than desirable boobs look bigger and therefore better. And a wig, which makes her look like she has better hair and sunglasses. And I mean, it just seems like, I don't know how we don't know that that's a disguise, especially in the 1970s, like wig, the wig technology was not there is what I'm saying. (laughs) And they are walking along, trying to like look nondescript. And I don't remember if it was a gust of wind. Something happens, and this all important wig just blows off of Wendy's head. And Wendy goes, "Oh, Malcolm!" Using his real name, Malcolm, my wig, Malcolm, help my wig! And this alerts all of the assassins in the area. <laughs> it's so silly. It's so dumb. Yeah. And they just, they shoot Wendy within an inch of her life. Uh, poor Wendy. Poor hapless Wendy. Um, so then Wendy is now on life support. Wendy is on life support. And the CIA guy, that the high up CIA suspicious guy that uh, Condor shot has also died under mysterious circumstances while mm-hmm. he was in the hospital recovering from his non-mortal wounds. So the plot thickens. Um, And now it gets very fast moving. A lot of like, this person's a double agent. No, that person's a double agent. And no, it's about this. And no, it's about that. And um, everybody's somehow connected and not connected. And um, so anyway, between uh, Malcolm slash Condor and his inside guy at the CIA, they kind of work out who the linchpin of this plot within the cia is and um it's a guy named mr atwood and malcolm um finds where the guy lives and um goes in and kills him and that scene is extremely different than it is in the movie because in the movie in the book it's just i think it's just malcolm and atwood i don't think the other guy Mm -hmm. shows up right until like after the after the guy's dead um so anyway um plot uncovered condor alive wendy barely alive um bad guy double agent guy's dead and um condor is probably no longer working from the cia or not no longer working as condor we're not really sure um what his future holds because you know just because they got the two guys at the center of this doesn't mean they got everybody there were other governments involved and um yeah it's about oil somehow forget, it's confusing but, it's also it's about buying heroin like shipping in heroin from laos i believe yes it's something to do with drugs and oil and and this, and and again like loosely the vietnam part of the globe somehow right china and china. yeah like that china and uh and viet anyway it's so it, it's very convoluted but um but very suspicious suspect and um enough that this atwood guy has to go and so um so condor condor kills I, the second guy that he kills i think he only kills the two guys right and um yeah so at the, when at the end of the thing condor who which as we all know is an endangered bird um it is the california state bird and it is i think it is still in it might i think it's still endangered um we have them here at the san diego zoo they are enormous and scary um and you live near a canyon i mean i do (laughs) (laughs) yes i see a lot of birds of prey actually (laughs) now that you mention it that i do um and condors are the biggest and scary they are 
terrifying, let me just say. Um, so this endangered bird is still alive, and uh, but his future is uncertain as the as the thing wraps. But Wendy's going to be okay. We don't know that they're going to have a future together because she's only just barely okay. You know, she's alive. She's got some and recovery to go through. Let's she she needs okay. Let's just say she needs a lot of. She could use some more tools. Is all I'm saying. Which, she needs friends some more tools. that around her, Good like, ones. forget this guy, please. Yeah, this is maybe a not this guy. journey here. Mm-hmm. But he goes to the New York Times, right? In the in the book as well. I think he does also uh, go to the go to the New York Times um, or go to, a, you know, to a journalist at the very they least. They go back and forth between D.C. and New York. Um, Correct. During these various adventures. Uh, but it's, yes, it that is like kind of like the the overall idea and i get mm-hmm. why anybody in hollywood especially once again the year richard nixon is you know is it's resigning perfect the time it's it couldn't the be perfect better story at the perfect time it's an american james bond yep um in the bumbling watergate um yeah again deep state before that there was a deep state uh, time Vietnam. I mean, it, it's it was perfect timing, and it is a very cool idea. You know, it's a absolutely. good story. Yeah, absolutely. And and you, and you as a writer, you always want to come up with that really cool story. Like, what's my hook? And then just write around yeah. it would be just brilliant. So anyway, like we said, he's super young, and he gets a deal by mailing the manuscript 24. to the publisher. Twenty-four, right? Twenty-four. And they offered him, and it was like a lot of money for the time, uh, just for that. And then they say, "Oh, and this is for the paperback, and oh, and this is for your sequel." And they're going to yeah. make a movie. And he said, "We're going to write you another check, and a bigger check, and then a bigger check." <laughs> oh, and Robert Redford. <laughs> so, should we talk about this film now? Which, uh, okay. Oh yeah. Let me say just before, Margo. I don't know if you've been checking uh, Twitter, but this is like the top posts. I've I've been posting stuff, you know, in prep for the episode. The amount of interaction over the three days of the Condor is like nothing I've seen really? in a long time. Oh, I have not been aware because I've been gone. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. It's got a lot of fans, so we're gonna play the trailer right now, the original. Tra- oh, sorry for the 4K release, and then we'll get into this movie. This is a major. This is Joe Turner. Identification? My name is Turner. I work for you. Now listen. Identify yourself. What is your designation? Uh, Condor. Something has happened. Section 9, Department 17. The section's been hit. What level? What level? Level of damage. Everybody. Dr. Lapp, Janice, Ray, Harold. Everybody is dead. What is it? What is it? Are you damaged? Damaged? No. Are you armed? Identify the armament. It's a 45 automatic. Will you guys bring me in, please? I'm not a field agent. I just read books. This is the panic office. Section 917 may have been hit. Hit confirmed. It was a quality work. Clean, fast, first rate. Except they overlook one item. You say one of my people is still okay? Condor, you know him? No. Deputy Director Higgins, New York Center. I'm controlling now, Condor. Where are you? How come I need a code name and you don't? The head of your department just came here from D.C. He's going to bring you home. I've never met him. No worry. Two years military service. Separated 961. Worked at Bell Labs Communication Research College on the GI Bill. This Condor isn't the man his file says he is. But wait a minute. I don't... Get in the car. Don't make a sound. Don't be dumb. Come on, hurry up. Get in. I work for the CIA. I am not a spy. Your assignment for today was to go out and kidnap a girl. I'll need your help. Have I ever denied you anything? I don't think you're going to live much longer. Well, I may surprise you. We have games. What if? How many men? What would it take? Seven people killed. And you play games. And the other side does, too. 
Condor is an amateur. He's lost. Unpredictable. He could fool a professional. Yes? Do you believe the condor is really an endangered species? Include the condor episode without any more noise. We're already visible. Let's not become conspicuous. If company agents aren't enough, use freelance. Use whatever it requires, but end it. Robert Redford and Faye Dunaway in danger and in love in three days of the condor. Our director is Sidney Pollack, one of my favorite directors, my favorite movies. And I never think like how it's directed. I just think they're good movies. That's and I think that's his strength for me. Like Tootsie's Uh one of my favorite movies of all time. I I just yeah, I think like whenever I see a Sidney Pollack film and 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 for that matter, Sidney Pollack performance. (laughs) He's one of my favorite. His him and Tootsie is unbelievable he's in husbands and wives right is that with a he's in a Woody lot Allen? of stuff yeah. we talked about it with eyes wide shut remember but one of the things that i think he's so good at and i don't know you know i don't know enough about his um worldview i guess um to know like where this comes from but one of the things that i think is so cool about all of his films is the way the characters talk to each other is so realistic Mm-hmm. It just has, and again, it's is true when he's acting, you just believe that they're having a spontaneous, real conversation. They're talking about it in a way that never feels expositional, mm-hmm. um, especially in a story like this, which is a lot of exposition, right? Right. And yet when we're talking, when the characters are interact and reacting to each other, even over the phone, um, it feels spontaneous and conversational and and really fresh um in a way that is just timeless and and it's just something i just every time i see a sydney pollock film i i i come away with like hey, it's just it seems so fresh it seems like they are just spontaneously having this conversation right now i was listening to a, a podcast about and they were just talking about directors and um it's a dga podcast and one of the person people that were being interviewed brought up Sidney pollock and they're like he does the best like 10 minutes of a first part of a movie ever like the firm even which we you know we don't like that book totally. very much but Hate, he hated that it. book and not a not a huge fan of that film but i agree the first 10 minutes of that film brilliant it just yes and tootsie the amount of information yes. you're given A lot. A lot of information. And you also care about these characters, even the deeply flawed ones. He really just does that better than anybody. I first saw this. I I know I've seen this movie in the past. I wrote a book about movies in Brooklyn. So I watched this on Amazon a couple of years ago. I super enjoyed it. And I watched it again this week after reading the novel and it's, I've, I've, I've kind of rediscovered this movie but let's talk about our, our writers our screen the screenplay is Lorenzo Semple and David Raphael and they do an excellent job of like making those little bit of changes we have Robert Redford as our lead I mean I would say one thing if there's anybody get that's going to stand out in a crowd it's Robert Redford it's like the Matt Damon thing too like anyone would notice this person anywhere <laughs> It's true. It's not. Angelina it's really Jolie true. plays spies. I'm like, why? He is <laughs> not blending in. Yes. At all. But that's okay. Um, uh, no, it's okay. It's fine. I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad um, at it. He's. No, but the, the, I totally agree, though, about the screenplay that if Robert Redford in this movie was as Condor is in the book, just the guy who heard about the plot and didn't understand it. And found himself in this situation. Like, he just wouldn't buy that because he's Robert freaking Redford. Right. So the choice to make him the one who's uncovering the plot that leads to all of this makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. I think, although we still only have three women (laughs) in the story, um, the way that they're treated in the movie is so, like miles away uh, ahead of where the book is 
the women in the in the building who are killed very early on in the movie, um, the older woman behind that desk who's supposed to be like the kindly spinster lady, she is a badass. Like we see right off the bat that she is packing heat. She is unflappable. She's not putting up with anybody's crap. She's not making a drop of coffee for those men. You know, totally different kind of uh, portrayal. And then the the other, the younger female agent to make her, what we see instead of her being, as she is in the book, this, she's kind of dumpy, not, she's portrayed as not very bright, you know, because of course she can't make good coffee. Um, but but in this portrayal, like we see her right off the bat, she's dealing with some high level stuff. She's very smart. He is going to her for advice. Right. He's asking her, like, what do you think? I have this theory, but does it make sense to you? You are really smart. You have a real head for this. And we learned that they have a relationship that's not in the book at all. Um, he's so patronizing of that character in the book. In the book also, I forgot um, to mention, Margo, there's a whole thing about how every day he watches a girl walk to her office oh, at the same time yes. and her breasts do this and she's so pretty. He and- this girl who <sighs> walks across the street to her job from his office office perch every morning like that's his little treat every morning. like okay that's just 24. how he looks at women and so um, in this movie it's completely <laughs> different he has this totally different he, he has, has a, a real relationship like obviously like they have a relationship of equals they are both cia agents they rely on each other yeah so they and they have a couple friend they're supposed to have dinner with that night i love the way that the that the screenplay does that because that's totally different than in the yep. book as well yeah i think that's a brilliant choice so yeah, we see him we see him take the shortcut out of the building to save time because it's raining, which I think is a great device. And and I think the the scene of the what do you want to call it, a massacre is also better than in the book. It doesn't it's fast. It's fast, which is how it would be. You would get they would go in, they would do the thing, they'd get out and before anybody is any the wiser. And if you don't um, under, know what the plot of the, of this movie, I mean, it's amazing because it really does take you by surprise. You go, what? What? <laughs> yeah. And also for me, and this is, they have a camera outside. Why mm-hmm. don't they have a camera inside to like watch? The, okay. That's that's one thing I'm like, okay. But this is where we meet Max. Okay, Fun- CIA. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right? But Max, okay. Yeah. Okay. Max von Sydow, he he's our Jerbo. Uh huh. Yeah. He's our he's our killer. He's our vigilante hired assassin. And he's with the ma- the postman who also shows up in another scene at uh, Cranberry Street, where's this, where my friend lives. It's right across the street from my friend ah. lives, where Faye Dunaway is. We'll get to Faye Dunaway. So well, we'll get in her fabulous seventies apartment. I want it. I'm Me actually too. I could totally live there. The kitchen with the, oh okay we'll get to that later. Yes. So. <laughs> He, yeah, so he comes back and his whole office is, and so he, and, and Redford, by the way, gorgeous. This is like peak, his gorgeousity is just seriously. like, seriously, but he's, he's doing a great job acting too. I mean, he's really, he's responding like, oh my God, all of my friends, all these people I love. And my girlfriend. My girlfriend dying all around me and I got to leave because they're, any minute now they'll realize I wasn't here that they're missing a person. So he goes and then yeah. he calls it's in. It's clear they were, whoever was there was out to get everybody. And the fact that they did it, you can tell that they did it super quickly that they did, it was just about killing everybody. It wasn't about going after a particular person. Um, therefore, I, somebody's yeah, as you say, somebody's going to figure out, like probably has already figured out that I wasn't here. I need to, I can't like do anything about my girlfriend here. I got to get out of here. Yeah, it's a great performance. This is a major. This is Joe Turner. Listen, identification? What? Identification. Uh, my name is Turner. I work for you. Now listen. Identify yourself. Uh, well, I don't. What is your designation? Uh, Condor. Section nine, Department seventeen. The section's been hit. What level? What level? Level of damage. Everybody. Doctor Lapp, Janice, Ray, Harold. Harold was in the. Uh, uh... Are you in a company line? 
No, no, I'm in a phone booth. I'm, I'm just a block away. I'm in the street. You're in violation of secure communication procedures, Condor. Listen, you son of a bitch. I'm telling you, I came back with lunch and it was raining and the whole house was murdered. Everybody is dead. Right. Has the incident been discovered by anyone outside the company? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Are you damaged? Damaged? No. Are you armed? I don't, I have Mrs. Uh, I don't, can't remember her code name. Nightingale. She was afraid of being raped. She kept a gun. I've got the gun. Identify the armament. It's a 45 automatic. Can you guys bring me in, please? I'm not a field agent. I just read books. Leave the area. All right, well, what, do I come into headquarters now? Negative. Find a secure location. The way that he acts with everybody is, so, like, you see the panic in him. You see him trying to put the pieces together, but they're not fitting. He doesn't want to kidnap Faye Dunaway, but he has to kidnap Faye Dunaway. In the ski shop. That's a different thing, too. Well, first he goes to the Guggenheim, but he's, he's. I mean, they're like, go someplace. Don't go to your apartment. Just And it's Cliff Robertson that we find out soon uh, from the World Trade Center. But anyway, so he goes to the Guggenheim. He's doing because that's where he would go. He's a super smart person. That's where he would go and hang out. And then he realizes like he so he Cliff Robertson. Basically, we find out he's based at the at the World Trade Center. Uncle Ben, by the way. And it must have been every time I see him, I just think about Uncle Ben and I just have to not cry. <laughs> it's hard. Also, did you see Charlie? I, re- I saw the movie Charlie when I was a kid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he's lovely. He's a lovable person, a likable person. So it's very funny when you have like somebody like that playing the heavy, but he's saying to Robert Redford, okay, go someplace and make sure this person is with him. And Sam Roberts is his name, I believe. And it's a man saying Sam is his friend. And so we're going to have this guy and Sam, the friend, and that way he'll come out and then, they meet him in an alley, 1970s alley. So it's got the garbage cans and the trash. Lots of garbage. Got to be garbage. Of garbage. It's lots of garbage. And then Rob, that's when Redford realizes this guy is trying to kill him, kills his friend, shoots him right between the eyes. And that's the one they're going to have dinner with that night with his girlfriend. Okay. So they, so he realizes, oh my God, I got to get on the run. Where do I go? He uh, tries to go back to his apartment. And that's when the landlady or the super's like, oh, your two friends are in your place right now. He's like, gotta go. So where does, where does yeah. he go? Cause it's this, like I said, he probably doesn't have a lot of cash on him. A probably, I mean, where can he go? So this is when we go to a ski shop and that's when we meet Faye Dunaway. And let, let's take a minute. The beautiful Faye Dunaway is, I mean, <laughs> She's so good in this. She really she, is. She's absolutely gorgeous, as always. I mean, she just... She can't not be. They don't know She can't not be. But, you know, this is the era. This is the era of, again, talk about, like, peak glamour. Bonnie and Clyde. Thomas Crown Affair. But I network. really buy her... I Network. I really buy her, Mommy Dears, as... Trying to. Um, <laughs> as this... this as this kind of just, you know, she's an ordinary, you know, young woman in 70s New York. She's trying to figure out her way in this, uh, you know, me generation. She's got a boyfriend, but she's, she doesn't know how she feels about him. She's got dreams, but she doesn't have a lot of options for pursuing them. And she's, you know, yeah, I mean, I just really, I, it's a great performance too. Like you really buy that she's somebody who is very smart. She doesn't believe him. You wouldn't believe him. He's, it's unbelievable what he is saying. I don't care that it's Robert Redford. It's unbelievable. And even when he's being nice to her, she's like, why are you being nice to me? Like, you know, you have a gun here, right? And we're in my apartment. You know, she, she, and she's smart enough to be like, why did you tie me up? Why are you doing this? Why, why this, why that? And she knows like just how much, to try and get answers without putting herself in more danger. You know, she's just super smart, scrappy, way more interesting than the the girl in the book. I work for the CIA. I am not a spy. I just read books. We read everything that's published in the world. And we we feed the plots, dirty tricks, codes, 
into a computer, and the computer checks against actual CIA plans and operations. I look for leaks, I look for new ideas. We read adventures and novels and journals. Oh, she's what I'm saying. She's a photographer. She has her own life. She's a freelancer. In my head, I get the feeling this guy is married. That uh, she's that she's seeing. I do too. I I think uh-huh, that's what I think too. that's the problem. Right, right. Mm. And so he's not leaving his wife or whatever. But so she's going on this vacation with him, and he keeps her clothes at his apartment. But like we said, she's she's not trust. She's skeptical about this relationship. What the prospects are. But anyway, so this gives him a perfect reason. I mean, he puts a gun in her. She's hops in her jeep. They go to Brooklyn Heights, and then he hangs out in her apartment. And then he immediately ties her up and takes off. And she's home all day being tied up, tied up, tied up. But she, you know, look, it's Robert Redford and, and it's Faye Dunaway. Do I want to watch them make out? Yes. So, of course, <laughs> is this but I like, plausible? I mean, it's no, not, it's but... so much more. It's not the most plausible thing for them to jump into bed together, but it makes so much more sense than in the book. In the book, you're like, this girl is crazy. Not got a grip on reality. No. What? Where is she living? What? Who did you kidnap? You know, maybe you shouldn't trust somebody who's going to do that, you know? Yes. In the movie, there's a lot. First of all, there's more time that passes. You know, more hours. They, it's, it's not a lot of time. three days. They, they stick it down. But it's more time. Right. Which is a better number yeah, than six, it, by the way. Three is better than six. I agree. And they have more interaction that is, again, more plausible. They ask questions that you would ask of each other. He is trying to make a case to her about what's going on that makes no sense. But it, we know that it's true. And then, we, again, we have the thing where the mailman shows up and takes a shot. And that's where she really believes what's going on. But at that point, they've already slept together. You have a lot of very fine qualities. But... What fine qualities? You have good eyes. Not kind, but they don't lie. And they don't look away much. And they don't miss anything. I could use eyes like that. But you're overdoing Vermont. You see a tough guy. Be tough. What will he do? I understand. Boy, that is tough. Anyway, um, and we don't dwell on it. You know, it's not like in the book. And again, I'm going to use the word juvenile. It's kind of juvenile the oh, way it's... that he describes. It's, I mean, just dude. Um, it's it's much more tasteful <laughs> in the movie. He was young, although it was his let's first not forget novel. she was kidnapped. <laughs> right. I mean, it's. But look, we got Faye Dunaway. We got two people at their peak hotness. They're doing a great job. Like with the lines she's given and what she has to come across, it seems very. They're not the greatest, but, but she's she, doing a great job. She has a couple of lines though, where she says, "Well, you know, I am the spy effer, so I guess I will be helping yeah. you." Great line. There. I mean, I do like the script. I think they're. They have to take the situation. They needed a beautiful woman for Robert Redford to make love to. So we all want to see. And so if you get somebody as great as Faye, and I could picture Faye Dunaway being like, okay, how do I make this character come to life that we care about her and that we are okay? We don't think she's some dumb bimbo following a guy, but we, she, they team up together. And this is when uh, we get, find out John Hausman. We even mentioned Hausman yet is in this movie. Uh, I don't know. He's a super, super, super high up CIA guy. And I could listen to him talk all day. He's so smart. 
and witty and we love him love him and and he's talking about like he's with in europe he's in charge of something overseas but he's saying that you know back in world war ii somebody said did you like it better than he just i liked the clarity i you know you knew the, who the good guys you knew who were the bad guys were and the bad guys exactly and now you're sort of like well we're robbing peter to save paul or you know what are we what are we doing here? He understands that. And so we find out Jabert is also like a freelancer. He's just somebody they hire as a hitman. Yeah. If he's not, he's one day he's hired to kill Condor. The next day he's hired to not kill Condor. So he doesn't kill him. And he, um, he shrugs his shoulders. Yeah. Like, yeah, well. And they all, as in the book, and this is true in the book too, they all kind of start to develop an admiration for this guy, you know, because he's not an, he's not, somebody who's got the training that they have. He's not somebody who's got the experience that they have. He is a bookworm, but he's he's clever and resourceful and has used the stuff that he's learned in these books to stay alive uh, under extremely unlikely circumstances. And, you know, we have the, a lot of like back and forth. Who was this? Faye Dunaway is like, here she is. She's Bonnie again. You know, she's, yep. she's really helping him out, really sticking her neck out to help this guy. And bring in Higgins, who is starting to understand, like, the, starting to figure out how the pieces connect. They all lead to get into this guy, Atwood. We show up at Atwood. And this is, again, this is different than in the book. Um, Condor shows up at Atwood's home. And he's got him at gunpoint. And he's like, help me understand this. Make it make sense. Why are you doing this? And they figure out it's about oil. It's the 70s. You know, gas lines. Oil was uh, something that was very much on people's minds, the price of oil and all of that. I mean, cars, when you think about the mileage that they used to get, I mean. We talked about this. Cars used to be You got huge. like three miles a gallon and they were enormous. <laughs> they were enormous and they took up a lot. They, they, they would were... take up the whole front of your house if you were parked in front oh, of your house. Oh they my God. To... Hard to describe how large these cars were. And parallel parking those things, I can't even begin because they don't have any of that anyway. But so these cars were big. Um, there's inflation is rising. Mm -hmm. There's political instability. There's social mm -hmm. instability. There's, you know, people are seeing space creatures. You know, the UFOs are, sightings are going through the roof. Like there's, everything is happening, especially in America at this time. So it it's just this perfect combination. Like um, Planet of the Apes came out in 1968. That is like the brilliant time for that kind of a movie to come out, considering what's going Absolutely. on in the world. And for this movie to come out in 1975 is just beyond brilliant. I mean, the, like Gerald Ford is still president. Uh, he's going to pardon Nixon soon. There's all these things things happening and so then we get this movie and we like i said cliff robertson's hair what they do with his hair is just i'm slow delight. clapping delight it's, it's a masterpiece I, but the world trade center like the, the access they had to certain buildings and the and the, the, it just feels so real right yeah it does it's so plausible yeah so he and Joubert kind of have this meeting where uh, he realizes Cliff Robertson is what he's doing. And then Joubert is saying, hey, you know, you're pretty good at this. You should be like me. You only have to work, you know, part time. But, you know, if you're kind of a loner, you don't mind that, you know, this might be good for you. Yeah. And he's looking at him like, you're crazy. No, I'm not doing this. I don't want to go around killing people. No, it's wrong <laughs> to do that. In the movie, and I absolutely, completely love this. I mean, he and Cliff Robertson have this conversation. We have games. That's all. We play games. What if? How many men? What would it take? Is there a cheaper way to destabilize a regime? That's what we're paid to do. Walk on. Go on. So Atwood just took the games too seriously. He was really going to do it, wasn't he? It's a renegade operation. Atwood knew 5412 would never authorize it. There was no way, not with the heat on the company. Well, what if there hadn't been any heat? Supposing I hadn't stumbled on a plan. Say nobody had. They're a ball game. The fact is, there was nothing wrong with the plan. Well, the plan was all right. The plan would have worked. Boy, what is it with you people? You think not getting caught in a lie is the same thing as telling the truth? No. It's simple economics. Today it's oil, right? In 10 or 15 years, food. 
plutonium. Maybe even sooner. Now, what do you think the people are going to want us to do then? Ask them. Not now. Then. Ask them when they're running out. Ask them when there's no heat in their homes and they're cold. Ask them when their engines stop. Ask them when people who've never known hunger start going hungry. You want to know something? They won't want us to ask them. They'll just want us to get it for them. Boy, have you found a home? Seven people killed Higgins. The company didn't order it. Atwood did. Atwood did. And who the hell is Atwood? He's you. He's all you guys. Seven people killed. And you play games. Right. And the other side does too. And I could tell a lot about a person by what they take away from this conversation. Like, whose side do you take in this whole thing with Robert Redford and Cliff Robertson? And Cliff Robertson's like, we just play games. You're going to need oil, you know, and we need like 10 years from now to have a decent relationship with the Middle East or we need to be in charge. And, you know, and we're willing to, you know, what does it take? Break a few eggs to make an omelet. And Redford's like, no, you're lying. And he says, if you think you're not, if you're not telling, if you're not telling a lie, you're telling the truth, and those are two different things, right? And he yes, and that's uh, I love this scene with Chris, they're in Times Square. None of this is in the book. None, none of this. <laughs> no, so they're in Times Square. I mean, it's such a beautiful time to shoot it, and then it's Christmas season. You can I hear the mean, Christmas carols in the background. I the mean, Christmas carols. What? It's so good. It's so good. It's and, so good. And Red, Redford says. Um, he basically indicates, guess where we are? This is the old New York Times building. That's what I'm saying now. That's the old New York Times building. And he says, I'm, and he's giving them a whole thing of books. And he's like, I'm giving them the story. And the year before, the Washington Post had a big story about Richard Nixon. So this makes sense. It, of course. Makes perfect sense. And that's when Cliff Robertson, I love his speech. He's like, oh, what did you do? You don't get it. And then he says to Redford, Redford's like, they're going to run that story. And, and he says, are they going to run that story? I know. And you're like, <laughs> oh, no. And you see his face like, oh, yeah, they're, you're the CIA. <laughs> they're, 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 they've tightened things up with their relationship with the press. Like, they've got a lot more control than I do. Like, what is going on? So you and that's just how they end it. Like, you don't know. Does the story run? Is the condor okay? Like, what happens to this guy? It's, I have to say, like, uh, I, at first, when I watched it again this week, the first time, maybe it was the mood I was in or the time of day, I, I was a little like, oh, this, these, the love scene's kind of silly and that's kind of silly. And then uh, this time I watched it again, I'm like, I loved it. And I was completely, I think the it's soundtrack just, is really, fun. It's excellent. The, se- the sound design of this film is so brilliant from the machines at the beginning like those machines that are scanning the books and reading the books and computers 1970s computers enormous that are going on yeah the camera going when he runs out he sees the kids on the monitor that are going to steal his bike and he runs out because like so we know that there's a camera that you can see who's outside and um yeah it's all I just love the whole thing. It's the sounds are so great and the music is good. The way that they use the music, like when he's okay. Now we can talk about her apartment, her, her kitchen with the giant wooden, like the, those drawer pulls are these big wooden, they're like a hockey puck, like a big fat wood hockey puck that open the, the kitchen cabinets. And, um, and she's got like macrame and rattan, all the things. When I was a kid, I thought I'm going to have an apartment one day and it's going to look just like that. It'll be my space. Same. Yeah. I want that's That was my dream. In New York. And, in, a, um, yeah, right. in New York, in a basement. And I, one of my favorite sound moments in this movie is when he's in her apartment. He's desperately waiting for the news to come on to see how they're going to report uh, what has just happened to him, where his friend was shot by the high up CIA guy and he shot the high up CIA guy. And they turn on the TV and there is an Eastern airlines commercial 
Look up in the sky. <laughs> that could be you. Why isn't it you? And the, it, like the whole commercial, 30 seconds of this stupid commercial with this insipid jingle is playing while they're like desperate. He's holding Faye Dunaway at gunpoint, like desperately waiting for the news to start. A, a genius. Like it so builds up the suspense. It's stupid, stupid commercial. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and like you say, the Christmas carol, the Christmas carols at the end. Perfect. I just loved this movie. Yeah. It was so much fun. It was a delight. It did very well at the box office. And let me, it was nominated for best editing. I mean, 1975, when this movie comes out, that's your Jaws comes out. Uh, there, that's a huge year for movies, so it, it can probably get lost in all of that. Faye Dunaway was nominated for a Golden Globe Award. It was nominated at the Grammy Awards for Best Original Album Score. It's streaming on Amazon right now, if you have Amazon Prime. It's a fun movie. I really enjoyed it. it this is, this is, I mean, it's not even close when it comes to book first movie. With all due respect oh, no. to Mr. Grady. It's it, a great story. It it's is. A great story. And the writing is good. Really, my only beef is with the way the women are treated in the in the book. But apart from that, um, it is a rollicking, you know, yeah. like I said, it's perfect for, for an airport because it is so action packed um, that you just want to you, you, you're flipping the pages. You want to see what's going to happen next. And it's, it is good writing. You know, I can't say that it's not good writing. I just I not a lot of experience with women is what I think is going on there um, at that point in Mr. Grady's life, but a brilliant story for a movie. So it has a very cinematic feel to it, but this movie, it's I, again, the, the choices that the screen, the screenwriters made the changes that they made to the plot. Perfect. Yes. They work so much better. If they had done it the way that it was done in the book, it wouldn't have been plausible the way that it is in, in the movie. If you had just seen, Robert Redford having that conversation with his coworker Heidegger, who we never see in the movie ever. We don't even meet him in the movie. He just, he's just a name and a photograph on a hit list. Um, if we had done it where he was on, even on the phone with that guy hearing about it, like you just, you just wouldn't buy it. You just would not buy it. And I love the choice to make, uh, what's her name? Tina Chen, who plays the yes. other agent that he's in the relationship I love the way that her character, so how much of her character we get in the very tiny amount of screenplay and screen time that she has. Um, and I love the thing about um, the the close friend that gets shot of his, that he goes to the wife's house and saves her life, right. gets her out of there to save her life because he's a decent human being. <laughs> um, and I love the end. I love that flash of doubt and panic once he realizes, like, oh, mm, I might have done nothing here. <laughs> I just screwed myself. Um, but okay, off I go into the future, I guess. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. No notes. Movie, 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 movie. Movie, 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 movie. That was super fun. All right. So much fun. What are we doing next, Margo? Very exciting. It's so funny because I've seen... This is a, a, a favorite movie of mine. I saw it many, several times on the big screen. I've seen it several times on the little screen. Um, I remember when it came out and what a big deal it was when it came out. And um, and this was like, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago now. But I've seen it surface recently on social media. People are talking about it again as being a great example of um of this kind of storytelling and we're going to be talking and I didn't know that it was based on a short story is what I was that was all leading up to um had I known I would have brought this film up a lot sooner but we're going to be talking about smoke signals um which is based on a short story which is not called smoke signals it's called something else hold on I'll tell you what it's called we have a book of uh, short stories that uh, that have been adapted into film that Margo and I are just kind of obsessed with it's really been helping us put the show together it's a movie I've never seen oh here it is uh, the story is called This Is What It Means to Say Phoenix, Arizona by Sherman Alexi. Um, and the book, the movie is Smoke Signals. Oh, it's from 1998, so not quite that long ago. Uh, Smoke Signals, and the director is Chris Eyre. It's spelled like Jane Eyre, E-Y-R-E. -E. Okay. Um, I just love the... Um, 
the the family stories that are told in this movie I, and and i can't wait to talk about it I'm very very excited to see it again and uh and i'm going to do a little more research into why people are talking about it the by people i mean younger much younger than us <laughs> people well, talking about, about indigenous it on media. people correct in north america yeah. oh yes uh-huh yeah yeah there's but, been a so lot of the, news I, I in the last couple of years mm-hmm. about indigenous schools in North America, in the U S and Canada. Yes. So I think that's yeah. kind of like raising consciousness. Yeah. But it's a lot about fathers and sons. Um, oh, it's great. It's great. I can't wait to talk about it. I'm very excited. Please send us your suggestions. Uh, in September, we do banned books. I need to send you my ideas, Margo. Uh, October, we do scary books. We've got like some really fun ones coming up. Please, please reach out. All those places I mentioned. Once again, our email is book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, as long as that exists, at Brooklyn Margo. I'm at Brooklyn Fit Chick on Threads, Instagram. My site is Brooklyn Fit Chick. And I am on TikTok, where I put a bunch of scenes of Three Days of the Condor that people seem to really like at my name, Margo Donahue. All right, everyone, we'll be back soon with Smoke Signals. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags LadyPodSquad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book vs. Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book vs. Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book vs. Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margo D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margo P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show and we'll be back soon with a new